Hello Child of God. The purpose of this video is to summarize and tie together some of the most recent events in Israel and the rest of the world with some spiritual insights. The Apostle Paul wrote that we see through a glass darkly. In other words, most of the spiritual world is hidden from us to the point that what we see is only the shadows of the real spiritual things. On the 12th of June 2014, in the West Bank of Israel, three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped as they were hitchhiking to their homes. On the 30th of June, search teams found the bodies of the three missing teenagers in a field northwest of Hebron. They had apparently been killed shortly after their abduction. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held Hamas directly responsible and vowed a tough response to the killings. The kidnapping and murder of a 16-year-old Palestinian boy occurred the 2nd of July, a day after the burial of the three murdered Israeli teenagers. Israeli police located his charred body a few hours later in the Jerusalem forest. The autopsy suggested that he was beaten and burned while still alive. These two horrible events cascaded into revenge killings and then Hamas's rocket attacks against Israeli civilians, and then the Iron Dome response and military response from the Israeli soldiers. I'm just summarizing a few of the events that are taking place during the time between the first and second blood red moons and on the ninth of Av in 2014. There is a world war going on among spirits continuing in the shadows beyond our sight and understanding. The Apostle Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians, No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Child of God, there exists a blindness on all of mankind concerning the spiritual wars of angels and demons. In this video, I will explain some of the insight that I have concerning prophecies, but there is a much greater purpose in your understanding the spiritual message of this video. The message is plainly that the Holy Spirit wants to take away the blindness from all of our eyes and show us the spiritual world for the glory and the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. If Hamas understood the spiritual mystery, they would have not killed the three teenagers which set off this entire series of events which Almighty God used to destroy a much greater threat to Israel. If you're willing, ask the Lord to remove all the spiritual blindness from your mind and give you more insight into the spiritual world. You can pray for it as you are watching this video. I have no idea what the Holy Spirit would teach you, but I know that He is the Holy Teacher and that Jesus said He would teach you all things. And as you pray, listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you in a wee small voice like a thought to your spirit. At this moment, Israel is surrounded by billions of Muslims. Many of them would sacrifice their life for the opportunity to kill a Jew of any age. Ironically, most of those Muslims lived their entire life without ever meeting or seeing a real Jewish person. Please pray for insight as I play a few short Bible verses from 2 Kings. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, 
Behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass, when they were come into Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Here you see actually a different example of civilians climbing on the roof of a building because they've been asked to act as human shields. The uh, rectangle that you see in the center uh, is the UNRWA's Shahada al Manas Elementary School for Boys. That's the uh, uh, thing that you see there in reddish, uh, uh, reddish color. And you see right around that, four mortars fired, five mortars were fired, one mortar fired, one mortar fired, right around that school. It's very important to see that and to understand what kind of conditions our forces are facing from Gaza. Here's a, a terror tunnel near a school. Uh, you see the, the big uh, building to the right of the arrows, that's a school. Uh, you see civilian houses a uh, distance of a few meters, a mosque literally touching the school. Uh, civilian uh, houses uh, uh, around it. Uh, this is where the terror tunnels are dug. May I say that in many places, the terror tunnels were dug from homes, from homes, from inside the homes. So uh, that is an example, again, of the use of civilian areas both to fire rockets at our civilians and to dig the terror tunnels for the death squads to uh, reach and uh, our people, kidnap and kill them. Uh, I expect now that the uh, members of the press are leaving uh, Gaza, or some of them are leaving Gaza, and are no longer subjected to Hamas restrictions and intimidations, I expect we'll see even more documentation of Hamas terrorists hiding behind the civilian population, exploiting civilian uh, targets. I think that's very important for the truth to come out. The goal of uh, Operation Protective Edge was and remains to protect Israeli civilians. That means to protect our people from roughly 3,500 rockets, 3,500 rockets that Hamas and the other terrorist groups have fired on our cities, on our towns, on our civilians, on our children in the last month. The goal of uh, this operation was to protect our people from the threat of terror tunnels built to send death squads, squads into Israel to commit terrorist atrocities against Israel's civilians, to kidnap and to kill. Israel deeply regrets every civilian casualty, every single one. We do not target them. We do not seek them. The people of Gaza are not our enemy. Our enemy is Hamas. 
Our enemy are the other terrorist organizations trying to kill our people. And we've taken extraordinary circumstances and measures to avoid civilian casualties. The tragedy of Gaza is that it is ruled by Hamas, a tyrannical and fanatical terror group that relishes civilian casualties. They want civilian casualties. They use them as PR fodder. So it's not that they uh, don't want them. They want them. And they pretty much say so. Indeed, Hamas has adopted a, a strategy that abuses and sacrifices Gaza civilians. They use them as human shields. They endanger them and deliberately increase the death toll. They fire their rockets at Israel from schools, from hospitals, from mosques. You've just seen that. From urban neighborhoods and uh, right next to schools where journalists are staying. You can uh, discover that for yourself. Of course, uh, nearly everyone says that they, are, they support Israel's right to defend itself. And we appreciate those who say this. But there are those who refuse to recognize to, or to let Israel exercise that right. They would allow Hamas to attack with impunity because they say they're firing from schools or from mosques or from hospitals. And Israel should not take action against them. That's obviously a mistake. It's a moral mistake. It's an operational mistake. Because that would validate and legitimize Hamas's use of human shields and it would hand an enormous victory to terrorists everywhere and a devastating effect to the free societies that are fighting terrorism. If this were to happen, more and more civilians will die around the world. Because this is a testing period now. Can a terrorist organization fire thousands of rockets at the cities of a democracy? Can a terrorist organization embed itself in civilian areas? Can it dig terror tunnels from civilian areas? Can it do so with impunity because it counts on the uh, victimized country to respond as it must, as any country would, and then be blamed for it? Can we accept a situation in which the terrorists would be exonerated and their victims accused? This is the issue that stands not only before the international community today regarding Israel, it stands before the international community with a wave of radical terrorists that are now seizing vast cities, civilian population, and doing exactly the tactic that Hamas is doing. That's exactly what ISIL is doing, what Hezbollah is doing, what Boko Haram is doing, what Hamas is doing is what Al-Qaeda is doing. And the test now is not merely the test for the international community's attitude towards Israel, an embattled democracy using legitimate means against these double war crimes of targeting civilians and hiding behind civilians, the test is for the civilized world itself, how it is able to defend itself. Israel accepted and Hamas rejected the Egyptian ceasefire proposal of July 15th. Now I want you to know that at that time, the conflict had claimed some 185 lives. Only on Monday night did Hamas finally agree to that very same proposal, which went into effect yesterday morning. That means that 90%, a full 90% of the fatalities in this conflict could have been avoided had Hamas not rejected then the ceasefire that it accepts now. Hamas must be held accountable for the tragic loss of life. It must be ostracized from the family of nations for its callous abuse of civilians. And Hamas must be prevented from rearming as part of Gaza's general demilitarization. That is the sure way to guarantee that this conflict will not repeat itself. And I'm very glad that Secretary Kerry and others have put forward the need to demilitarize Gaza. This uh, is a long-standing Palestinian obligation yet to be fulfilled. Setting anew this long-term goal is important for Israel. It's important for the people of Gaza and for all of us who want to see an end to the violence and an end to the suffering. Every civilian casualty is a tragedy, a tragedy of Hamas's own making. I think the uh, 
Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel put it best when he said, Hamas is engaging in child sacrifice. And this is something for which it must be held accountable. For the sake of all our children, it must not be allowed to get away with this. To ask, you mentioned the uh, Israeli acceptance of the ceasefire, the Egyptian proposal, the first time around um, on the 15th of July. That was before the ground operation, before the tunnel attack near Sufa. And I wanted to ask, were you there for, if, if, if Hamas had accepted the ceasefire at that stage, um, the tunnels would not have been dealt with? And I wanted to ask, therefore, what people are asking, um, <laughs> Was it a strategic goal? Was it a goal of this operation? Was Israel kind of improvising? Was there a strategic plan here? Or were you going with the flow? And the second question, if I may, um, we've seen since, <coughs> since the West Bank operation, since the Gaza operation, a rise in attacks in Jerusalem, violence in Jerusalem, riots in Jerusalem, Temple Mount. And I just wondered uh, if there is concern of uh, a spread of the violence of uh, perhaps uh, an intifada in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we uh, started dealing with the tunnels. First of all, we were going to deal with the threats posed from Gaza, uh, either by military means or by uh, diplomatic means. One of the two, or both. We began dealing with the first tunnel before the Egyptian uh, initiative. I don't know if you're aware of it, but we had uh, information about an impending attack from uh, one terror tunnel, and we took action before uh, we had the uh, air attacks on our, uh, before we had the air attacks on uh, Gaza in response to their rocketing attacks. We actually dealt with one tunnel. If we could have dealt with the rest of the tunnels through the Egyptian proposal, which had an immediate ceasefire, as we have now, and both sides can raise the topics, and specifically the issue of security would be raised that was mentioned there. When we said security, we meant, obviously, that we would bring up the question of the tunnels. Could we deal with it through uh, non-military means uh, and the other threat against Israel? That's preferable. As it turned out, Hamas rejected this, and therefore we had to deal with it in military means. So we addressed the other tunnels, in addition to the one we had already addressed with military means, by uh, doing the... Uh, by actually going in. That first tunnel was struck from the air. We didn't know that it achieved the result, and it's very hard to achieve that result from the air. You either achieve it by agreement, or you achieve it by actually going in to the other side, finding the points of origin of the tunnel, or a point of origin, identifying the trajectory of the tunnel, and then uh, dismantling it, destroying it through various means. And that's basically what we did. If we could have done it uh, diplomatically, fine. If not, we did it militarily. And the army just told us that they completed the, this activity. And then we went out. We went in to deal with the tunnels. We went out after we finished dealing with the tunnels. A Jerusalem question, Prime Minister. Well, obviously, we're concerned. Uh, we, we hope that uh, everyone, everyone will work now to uh, calm the situation. That has been our goal from the very beginning uh, in Jerusalem, everywhere, in the Palestinian areas. Uh, we don't need to see loss of life there any more than we want to see it on the Gaza front. Uh, I want to make sure that you mentioned the Temple Mount, so I want to make sure that everyone understands that Israel uh, respects and will continue to respect the status quo on the Temple Mount. Uh, we, we know that uh, uh, there are arrangements there, including the traditional role of uh, the Hashemite King of Jordan, and we are not uh, about to change it. First of all, the IDF has suffered the largest casualties yet in any Palestinian uh, Israeli conflict. We understand 61 soldiers killed, three civilians. We've seen more than 1,800 people killed in Gaza, uh, 900 or uh, almost 1,000 of which are civilians, estimated. Do you really feel that your actions, Israel's actions, were proportionate? And were you using the appropriate precision weapons? even if Hamas is using them as human shields. And the second question, no, 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 please, we won't have, can I ask just, one yeah. question? Not everyone will be able to ask too. if you do too. And Very we won't briefly. let many people ask, please. Why don't you ask the first question? Let me answer that, then you can ask the second question. Why don't we do that? Uh, so first of all, the answer to both your questions is yes. I think it was justified. I think it was proportional. Uh, and that doesn't in any way 
take away from the deep regret for, we have for the loss of, uh, of a single civilian. We've gone to extraordinary lengths to avoid civilian casualties. Uh, Hamas has gone to extraordinary lengths to ensure that they have civilian casualties, as you've just seen. Now, let's imagine your country. Could be any country. Could be the U.S., could be Britain, could be Germany, France, India, you name it. Let's imagine your country attacked by 3,500 rockets. Your territory is infiltrated by death squads. What would you do? What would you demand that your government do to protect you and your family? You'd demand that and you'd be right because security, protecting pe the people, is the first obligation of any government. But what if the rockets are fired from civilian areas and the tunnels come from, from schools, from mosques, from private houses where civilians live? Should you then not take action? Do the terrorists have immunity because of the fear that some civilians will unfortunately get hurt? Let me tell you what I think disproportionality is. It's not acting to defend your people and giving the terrorists the license to kill. I think that's disproportionate and that's wrong. Are you prepared to give uh, Abu Mazen and the Palestinians, uh, Palestinian Authority a leading role in the post-war order in Gaza? And if so, can you talk about that specifics, including policing the borders? Uh, we uh, uh, have uh, cooperated and are cooperating with the Palestinian Authority uh, on matters uh, that you raised. There are other matters as well. Uh, and the answer is that we're cooperating with them and are prepared to uh, see a role for them. We're dealing with that right now. I think it's important in the uh, reconstruction of Gaza, uh, assuring the uh, humanitarian aid, uh, and also the security questions that uh, arise uh, that we have these discussions and the cooperations with them. And in fact, the ceasefire was uh, uh, coordinated, among other things, with them. It came from Egypt, but they were aware of it. Uh, and they were speaking to uh, for the factions, as you know. Uh, as far as uh, the humanitarian aid, since I mentioned it, um, you know, we've given 2,000, we've passed roughly 2,000 trucks of humanitarian aid during the uh, last uh, uh, month or so in which this conflict raged. We even gave humanitarian aid. Most of these trucks came during the fire. A lot of them came during the ceasefire, the humanitarian ceasefire that Hamas uh, refused to recognize for its own people. It's quite amazing. We have to do the ceasefire, the humanitarian ceasefire efforts when Hamas doesn't do it. So we even sometimes, uh, and many times actually, uh, unilaterally called ceasefire uh, humanitarian pauses, which they didn't recognize, but we put in the trucks. We opened a field hospital right on the Gaza passage and the Arabs crossing on our side, and we called Palestinians who have a problem with hospitals that were being used by Hamas as terrorist sites, as command centers, as firing posts. So we said, okay, we'll open a field hospital, and we did on our side. And you know what Hamas did? It prevented and warned Palestinians not to go there. Well, some of them straggled through somehow, and we dealt with them. We um, are now dealing with our people to ad address the fuel throughout the conflict, fuel, electricity stoppages, and so on. So Israel is going uh, all out on a humanitarian effort, and we're prepared to do more, and we think more should be done. We just hope that Hamas will start caring for its people and stop preventing humanitarian aid for them, stop sacrificing them as uh, human shields, stop shooting them, when they protest, because that's what happens when people protest and they say to Hamas, what have you done to us? Well, they just execute them. Just as they prevent journalists from putting out the full truth, and journalists justifiably are concerned. I can understand that. And Hamas, Hamas does incredible things, just incredible things. There's a, a report, it's not my report, it's the Journal of Palestinian Studies in 2012, note the year. It's a few years ago. They've since have done more things. Hamas officials, according to the Journal of Palestinian Studies, reported that at least 160 children 
have been killed digging the tunnels. There is something fundamentally wrong here. Hamas is sacrificing its people, sacrificing its children, and it should not be allowed to get away with it. These are tragedies. The loss of a single child is a tragedy. The loss of, of mothers, women, families is a tragedy. But this tragedy should be put squarely where the responsibility for it belongs. The responsibility for this tragedy belongs with Hamas. It's a deliberate strategy. I'm afraid the last question has to be from the Washington Post. Mr. Prime Minister, you mentioned Secretary Kerry's comments supporting the demilitarization of Gaza. I'm wondering if you also support what he said about the need to think bigger now, to use the Cairo talks as an opportunity to think more broadly about a two-state solution. And if so, what will Israel do to move in that direction? First of all, I had a very good conversation with John, with Secretary Kerry today. Uh, we work very closely with him and with the U.S. administration, with President Obama throughout this uh, operation uh, and before. Uh, there are reports uh, of uh, the substance and the, uh, the tone of our relationship are distorted. They don't capture the essence of uh, the common values that bind our societies together and bind our governments together. And I appreciate the support uh, that uh, the United States has shown for Israel's right to self-defense and the appropriation that I asked for, for an additional $225 million of uh, support for Iron Dome. I think these are all very important things for which the people of Israel are deeply grateful. And I want to express that. Uh, I think the Secretary's statement on uh, demilitarization as a strategic long-term goal is very important. I think he's right that there are opportunities now, perhaps uh, uh, opportunities that we've not seen before, with a realignment of uh, uh, important uh, parties in the Middle East uh, to be able to fashion a new reality, one more conducive to the end of violence, to the establishment of calm, sustainable peace, or at least a sustainable quiet, which can lead to other things. That has yet to be seen, but that is a goal, I think, worthy of uh, exploration and pursuit. That's my goal.